As we go through the book of Mark, we come upon passages that are strong, but every strong passage from the word of God has a purpose. Today it's uphold the sanctity of marriage. Uphold the sanctity of marriage. God's love plan for couples and singles is unchanging. And singles, God's got a love plan for you also. Couples, God's got a love plan that you're to live out so that others can see it. So th th there's a tough dis discussion that comes up in this passage, and we're going to walk through it. Let's uh, just stand for a moment for the reading of God's word as I read from Mark chapter 10, verse 1 to 10. Mark chapter 10, verse 1 to 10. Then Jesus left Capernaum and went down to the region of Judea and into the east river, in the area east of the Jordan River. Once again, crowds gathered around him, and as usual, he was teaching them. Some Pharisees came and tried to trap him with this question. Should a man be allowed to divorce his wife? Jesus answered them with a question. What did Moses say in the law about divorce? Well, he permitted it, they replied. He said a man can give his wife a written notice of divorce and send her away. But Jesus responded, he wrote this commandment only as a concession to your hard hearts. But God made them male and female from the beginning of creation. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Since they're no longer two but one, let no one split apart what God has joined together. Later, when he was alone with his disciples in the house, they brought up the subject again. Father God Almighty, would you, Lord, pierce this heart and this word into the hearts of every recipient in this place. Every single one of us, God, whatever capacity we represent, would you burn this message into our hearts, for your word is sharp. It is like a double-edged sword. It cuts into the dividing of soul and spirit. And Father, we want it to cut into the deep so that we will represent Christ's church the bride you said you're coming again and the bride is to be ready white and pure and that's what we want to be to help us today in Jesus name amen you may be seated Mark in this book has gone through so many different sequences and it's been an incredibly good uh, um, 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 series of going through miracles and, and, and pr talking about many pride issues and struggles and deliverance and everything is in the book of Mark. But now we come to one of these messages in Mark 10 where there's a spiritual lesson and these spiritual lessons, folks, must be shared from your pastor. We must never shy away from difficult texts as these difficult texts are for our betterment. We may not think it, but it is for our betterment because the word is always for our greater betterment. And many preachers have neglected to use this passage in fear of how people in the church will respond or retaliate. But all scripture is profitable. All scripture in the word of God is profitable for our growth and our development. And with divorce being so common, many pastors avoid the subject to keep from hurting feelings or causing conflict. I am not here today to hurt more feelings or cause more conflict, but I believe the word must be preached. Some people, some pastors even believe this, the Bible is no longer relevant to the issue in a world filled with no-fault divorces and we're living together and same-sex marriage are legal. But this is the farthest from the truth. In a world filled with living together and same-sex marriages, the sanctity of marriage must be upheld in a greater level. This is when we've got to raise the bar even higher because we lost it somewhere along the way. But God's not dead and we're not dead. So we have a right and a responsibility to raise it up even higher. So I want you to know all of God's word is good. And a, a true pastor never gets weary of instructing people in the truth. So here's what happens in Mark chapter 10. Some Pharisees, the religious people, they came to Jesus and they're asking him a question. They came to question Jesus. Now the interesting thing is they were not 
interested in the conversation for better. They just wanted to trap Jesus. It says it very clearly. And they came to trap Jesus. They're like, oh, this is good. We will trap him with this one. And that's basically today what the world is trying to do. The minute that we begin to speak about marriage between a man and a woman, oh, we're going to target them now. We're going to trap them. We're going to destroy them. And, and we, the church, then we go, oh, well, let's not talk about it because we don't want to be trapped and we don't want to be destroyed and we don't want to be. The word of God is unchanging. It is unending. It has been from the beginning of time alpha and shall be till the end of time omega. We don't need to get caught up in the controversies of the world. This one thinks that. That one thinks that. That's okay. Think what you want to think because you're going to do what you're going to do. Think what you want to think because you're going to do what you want to do. But as for me and my house, we shall praise the Lord. So we, we, we get caught up in controversies. And, and with the, the Pharisees, it was a hostile entrapment question similar to what we face today when the male and female question comes up. It's a hostile entrapment situation. Because here's the deal. At that time in Israel, there were two religious groups amongst the Pharisees. And both of them were engaged in divorce. The Pharisaical group, the Shammai, already divorced. Some said you can divorce for adultery. And the other said you can not divorce for adultery, but you can for incest. And, and it, they had a law listing this long and that long. Both groups were already divorcing. So when they came to Jesus, they wanted to get Jesus caught up in their controversy about who's more right, who's more wrong. And Jesus had to declare what the truth is. But here's what I want to remind us when we get caught in these conversations. Don't get involved in foolish arguments Ignorant argument. 2 Timothy 2 verse 23 says, Don't get involved in foolish, ignorant arguments that only starts fights. A servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but must be kind to everyone, be able to teach, and be patient with difficult people. That's what the Word of God says. We're going to get them in your workplaces. So you think marriage is only between man and a woman? Says, so you know what? You're going to think what you're going to think. I'm going to believe what I'm going to believe. You have a reason for what you believe. I have the Word of God, and I have a reason for what I believe. Can we just love each other and move on from here? Because it's vain controversy. And, and avoid the traps and stay focused on the facts. If someone is asking you because they really want to learn, then you show them what the Word of God says. But if they're asking you to show you how wrong you are, don't try to show them how wrong they are. Just it's a vain controversy. They're going to do what they're going to do. You live out what you should live out. Be what you should be and be proud to declare, I still believe in the word of God. It is my guide. It is my keeping power. Can I hear an amen this morning? So let's talk about the origin of divorce. God accommodated, here's the word. God accommodated divorce not by his design, but because of his continued love for his people and his consistent attempts to grant us mercy. God accommodated divorce because he so loves us that he will do anything to keep us in the palm of his hand. He so loves us that he wants to always be able to shower us with his creation and creative grace no matter what the situations of our lives. Moses, the Bible says, gave permission for divorce in the Old Testament as an accommodation for the weakness of the Israelites. It was an attempt to bring some sort of order into that society that disregarded God's standards. When we disregard the standards of the Bible, we're not just talking about Mark 10, but when we disregard all the other sin sin passages, it all leads to chaos. Mark had been preaching about pride. 
over and over and over again. When we disregard those words, pride takes over. When pride takes over, hostility takes over and many different factions. So Moses was dealing with Israel who was weak in following the words of the Lord, following the standards of God. And so then there began to be divorces. Why? God intended for marriage to be an unbroken lifelong commitment, but Israel were breaking many other standards, which was perpetually dragging them into other sins. See, if you don't do the Ten Commandments, when you begin to break any of them, you begin to break down many of the foundations until it gets to the point. It, uh, the Moses is going, they're in adultery. They, at one point, they had Phinehas who took a sword and ran it through an idolatrous man who was um, having an adulterous affair in public. They, they had lost their senses. And so Moses allowed... Uh, 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 um, uh, gave permission for divorce in that case. He was attempting to limit the effects of human sinfulness, but he was not encouraging divorce. He was just permitting it. The church needs to understand this. What, what God permits is not what God always sanctions. And God, who is an inseparable being, he intended for a male and a female in marriage to become one and would not be divided. And such union, such union in the physical demonstrates who God is in the spiritual. Do you know why marriage is so important? Because we don't understand the concept of God until we begin to see relationship amongst each other. When you've got a good father, you're like, oh, I understand God the good father. When you've got a good mother, you understand God who is a mother to us. When you have good marriage, you understand, oh, this is what being in touch with God and being in reunion with God and being in communion with God looks like. The physical, it actually helps us to learn how the spiritual works. Uh, 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 can I hear anybody out there? Just checking, just checking, just checking. It's a tough Sunday, but it's still in the word. I'll sing in between. <laughs> the doctrine of God regarding marriage is this. The character of marriage is instituted by God. Marriage has a character and the character should be good. It's broken in our world, but that's not the ideal. Let us not look at only the brokenness and make it the ideal. Marriage has a good character. It is to be loving to each other, be in relationship, to be joyful. Do you know God created marriage for joy, and yet so many have to live in drudgery? It's, can you imagine? The decay of marriage is instilled by the hardness of human heart. It has to deal with the many other sin issues. One sin leading to another sin, to another sin, to another sin, and then it all breaks down. Don't blame God for broken marriages. Blame the sinfulness of human hearts. And the restoration of marriage, my friends, is best accomplished by the transforming power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. God alone. You know, we do, like, there's lots we encourage, marriage counseling, marriage seminar, all of that. But until our lives are restored in union with God, we continually keep breaking the lower union. It is important that we recognize our life is about God, self, and others, not just about us. Our life is about God, self, and others, not just about us. Amen? I, I want you to understand that this morning because the new thing, the new mantra now is I have a right to be happy. I, I'm, I'm going to be happy now. It's me time. Anyone heard those? It's all about me now. But I'm sorry. Um, scripture and verse. Somebody, anybody, give me scripture and verse and I'll preach it for you. Because as far as I know, life is first about God. And it is about others. And then and we also take care of ourselves because self-care is important so that we reflect the glory of God. Second thing is this today. There are the God factors in this broken world. The God factors in this broken world. God does not by any means authorize everything which his grace tolerates. I love this one. Got it from one of the commentaries. God does not by any means authorize everything which his grace tolerates. What this is saying is he tolerates it because his grace is so vast, but he did not authorize it because his word is unchanging. 1 Corinthians 10, 23 to 24 says, you say I'm allowed to do anything 
but not everything is good for you. You say I'm allowed to do anything, but not everything is beneficial. Don't be concerned for your own good, but for the good of others. And this verse backs it up that there are times when we get so caught into it's my time, I've been doing, I've been in, now it's time that we begin to break down even the love factors that God created as normal part of our lifestyle. Now I've been talking a lot about marriage, married, so let me just throw in a few there. Singles, singles, widowed, divorced separated, abandoned, single by choice, or I added one for me, single by lack of choice. <laughs> How many of you out there go, Pastor, I'm with you. Let me see that. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Threw it in for you, honey. Threw it in for you. <laughs> Singles, male-female relationships. I, I want to talk to you for a moment because you see, because... We, we have this separation where marriage is and then singles are nobody or singles like, oh, they don't. We, we need to cut that out because we all should uphold the sanctity of marriage. Even if you're widowed, you still uphold it. You're divorced, you still uphold it. It was painful, but you uphold it. And when we break it down, we break it down for generations and we can't fix it because we're breaking it so severely. Male and female relationships should not be a, 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 a pl platonic uh, a, a, in, in a sense of when you look up platonic, it, it's saying that, that they're enjoying the company of each other uh, with relations. No, no. You see, keep yourself pure, singles. Keep yourself pure because then you're breaking down other laws of God. Keep yourself pure while you seek God for whatever answer you need. Keep yourself pure pure. When you're divorced and you're looking again, keep yourself pure. When you're widowed and you're lonely, keep yourself pure. When you're single, single, keep yourself pure because God can't bless impurity because, and then you'd say, look, I have disaster. Well, yeah, you know, one sin leads to another sin leads to disaster, and then it's not working. Friends, I want even the singles to hear me today. It is important that you develop healthy friendships. And even in those healthy friendships, develop it without sexual intimacy and then lead to great marriages. There's a lot of living together and all of that going on in the kingdom. I need to marry all of you off that are living together. Come see the pastors. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. <laughs> Glory. To God, I'm your pastor, I love you. I'm just saying, since I've been here, uh, we've only seen about half a dozen marriages. It concerns me when a church doesn't have a lot of marriages. We should be turning down a few and having a lot of marriage counseling and going, you're not ready. But when I don't see any, the world standard has dominated. And I'm calling it out in the house of the Lord today. In the name of Jesus. And then I want to mention this singles do not despise the other sex based on the failures of other humans in their relationship. Remember, God made an ideal, and you can strive to look for the ideal. Do you know one of the biggest problems is many singles now, is like, I'm not getting married. Did you see so so Did you see what just happened? And then the guy's like, I'm not married. No one knows women. You see those women? These women? And so we're basing marriage, God's institution. We're taking God's institution now, and we're basing it on the brokenness of humanity rather than on the goodness of God. We're basing it on so-and-so, that didn't work, so we're not going to go down that road. Men, men, you are called to marry. Women, you're called to marry. And if God's called you to be single, embrace singleness and have lots of friendships, but good friendships, healthy friendships. But, but I want you to know, it, it, you cannot allow the world to give us a system where we are not entering into the marriage union which reflects Jesus Christ and his church, the bride. It is wrong. It is wrong for this generation. It destroys children. It destroys their hope and their future. And so while I say all that, you know, I've got to add a little spice to it. Uh, singles, widowed, divorced, separate, well, no, widowed, separated, abandoned, single by choice, lack of choice. Keep God's ideal in view and be wise and winsome. I use winsome for two reasons, wise and win some. Um, <laughs> but winsome means attractive, engaging, appealing, 
all these things. Can I talk to the Christian community? Like, if you're going to be looking to date, be wise and, and be winsome. Like, you know, why do you have to look like dead and think that somebody's going to look for somebody dead? That's why they bring somebody from the world. And then they're like, Pastor, could you bless this one because this one's alive. And I'm going, we got people in the church. No, 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 no. We need to step it up. I'm going to speak clearly right here. Men and women alike, fix it up. God gave you a good, healthy life. Fix it up. Fix it up so we can marry you off to somebody in the kingdom. <clears throat> And don't come to me. I often say, don't start from the pulpit, honey. Don't start from the pulpit. Are, are you, church, are you okay with this? Because we have allowed the world to say, they advertise, they carry on, they do things a certain way, and then we look like uh, uh, the half dead, and people be like, I don't want to go to church because if I go there, I'll never find someone why is it that the world's saying they don't want to go to church because they'll never find someone, young people especially? This is where they should find good, healthy, wholesome people, men and women. Men, men, women are, there's lots more women and they're complaining that they can never find husbands. Fix it up, boys, fix it up in the name of Jesus. I'm going to marry you off soon. Help me, Jesus, before the anointing leaves. <laughs> And anybody in agreement with me this morning? Just say amen. But here's a key statement I want you to know. Two things. Psalm 68, verse 6. God places the lonely in families. Those of you that are uh, widowed or, or divorced or going through a tough time or single for a long time. God places the lonely in families. Okay? Thanksgiving is coming up. Please. Don't let bitter grow on your face. Go find a family in the church and go, I'm alone. Can I join you for Thanksgiving? If that family says no, there's a reason. Maybe they're going to somebody else's house and they, they don't even want to go themselves. So just, but, but don't expect nobody invited me for Thanksgiving. We're a big church now. Nobody knows where you are. Go tell the pastor or someone that you don't have anywhere to go. Don't just gripe and belly it, because that's when your face goes upturn rather than, sorry, downturn rather than upturn. Downturn, nobody's inviting you for dinner because nobody wants a downturn face. So would you, would you remember God has a family? Is that too hard on the church? I see some of you laughing, but I'm, I'm like, seriously here. <laughs> Help me, Jesus. Help me. Pastor, Pastor Josh, do I need some prayer covering or am I okay? All right. So here, well, let me race along. Friends, God places the lonely in families. If you are lonely in your world, you should be finding a church family. Church families, if you've got extra food and extra uh, uh, chairs, Look and ask who's around. Look for the people around you. Look for someone who's always coming to church alone and find out, do you have family coming? We should be the kingdom of God at all times and, and, and pray for God's provision so that their lives, that singles' lives are blessed and those that are by themselves. Uh, I, I want to give this verse that I can't afford to miss. Singles, this is a verse you write down for the rest of your life. And couples. God, Proverbs 23, 4, 23, guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Some of you, especially divorced, you've gone through some wretched things. Guard your heart. It is the wellspring of life. Don't let anyone ruin your heart. Yes, they crushed you. Yes, they stepped all over you. Yes, they, they disappointed you. Yes, they hurt you to the core. Let all of that happen, but don't kill yourself in the process of it. Rise up and go, boy, woman, you're going, sorry you left this. Man, no. And, and you rise up and let the issue of your heart be so strong that you become more beautiful than you ever were before. Can I hear an amen in this place today? So here's three things. Three tenets for marriage co contract. I need to share these. Marriage is a natural contract designed for the propagation and perpetuation of the human race. 
It is not to be degenerated into a form of selfish accompaniment and for mere sexual gratification. Marriage today is about mere sexual gratification. That's not the intent of God. It was for propagation and perpetuation of the human race. And that is why when it comes down to just sexual gratification, that is why you can have so many who don't want to be married, don't want to have kids, only want to take kids from other places. That's why you can have same-sex marriages because it's all about sexual pleasure and not about what God designed marriage to be. It is a natural contract for the propagation. Secondly, marriage is a civil contract entered into according to the laws of the state for the preservation and peace and prosperity of the land. When there's lots of marriages in the land, the social culture of the land changes. When there are healthy marriages in the land, the nation changes. When there's healthy marriages, the children change and they grow into different people. It is very important that we see what marriage stands for in the big picture. And when it's broken down and we walk with it broken, Leave it limp and broken. Generations are coming up not understanding that this is an institution by God which is for the betterment of our country, the betterment of our people, and the betterment of the future. <laughs> Marriage is also a sacred, sacred contract raised by the new law of Christ which is a higher and, and more natural form. It is designed with excessive spiritual components for for what? For human understanding of relationship with God. How are the children going to understand us being joined with God if they can't see families that are joined together? Marriage shows them what the union looks like. It shows us what our union should look like. God forgives. God heals. God delivers. God helps. This is what it's about. See, God intended for marriage to be a unbroken lifelong commitment an unbroken lifelong commitment and marriage should demonstrate the sacrifices of Christ this is the part that I have to push marriage should demonstrate the sacrifices of Christ what am I saying in that that you got to have some sacrifices you can't always have your own way and if women if you're getting your own way all the time you are not in true union men if you have to have your own way all the time you are not in true union marriage reflects the to sacrifice one of another, which shows us how God sacrificed for us so that we could be who we are today. That's why Revelation said we're in Revelation 19, we're looking forward to the wedding feast of the Lamb. See, Jesus, the purposes of marriage is this. Jesus wanted to demonstrate that marriage is a wonder. Do you know marriage is a wonder? Two people could come together and be one. Isn't that the same? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit are in union. And then he placed us in a two union to show us how what a wonder that is. But here's the deal, friends. Marriage is to be helped. It's to be a help, not a hindrance. Marriage is to be a help, not a hindrance. Uh, a husband and wife should complete and strengthen each other. Is that up there? Husband and wife should complete. A husband love should not deaden because... But instead, it should develop what is strong and unique in his wife's character. Men, what it's saying here, you should be developing what is strong and what is unique and what is, uh, is, 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 is just wonderful in your wife's character. How do you develop it? Encourage and, and compliment and, and, and appreciate. This is what makes the marriage stronger. But women... A wife's love should give the edge to her husband's individuality and heighten the worth of his work. A wife, this, this part, I don't want to go off because of time. Women, what it's saying here is a wife should not be a nag. Solomon said a nagging wife is like a dripping faucet. He, then he said, I'd rather be on the roof in the middle of winter. <laughs> he didn't add that part. He <laughs> said, I'd rather be on the roof than live with a nagging wife. Women were to, 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 to spawn, to, it, to, it, to develop the individuality of, of, of your spouse's life and work. When he leaves, 
going to work where he's going to feel beaten. He shouldn't leave going, oh, thank God I get out of here just so I could go get another whip. But there should be some encouragement. And I'm not saying that, ladies, that all the men are all perfect or that they don't stress you to nag when you told them ten times to pick that up from there and you still see it the tenth time. I'm not saying that you're not right, but I'm just saying we are, you can't send men out in a nag because then there's women out there going, I would nag you. And she, and she just lying. Because one man, once she get you, she going to nag too. Just saying. <laughs> Marriage should show the freedom where two souls are, are joined together in life union. Because marriage is sacred because it reflects the union of Christ. We must submit one to another. Men, it's a submitting one to another. Women, it's a submitting one to another. We're building each other up. The purpose of marriage is to build each other up. You know God created it for joy. You know God created it for joy. You know, uh, I'm, I'm going to share this story right about here. I shared it later on in another one, but I'm going to put it into the joy factor. Um, years ago, I was, when I was pastoring in another church, um, we had a bus trip going somewhere, and um, we, we, um, this lady came on the trip, and she had just lost her husband that week. And so we were all like, oh, wow, that's like kind of quick. Uh, and so on the trip, she was happy, singing. Glad. So people were like a bit worried. Um, so they went and said, Pastor, she's a little bit happy. I don't think she's dealing well with it. So we switched seats, and I went and sat beside her, and I said, are you, how are you doing? She goes, oh, I'm fine, Pastor. I said, well, you seem to be quite uh, uh, at joy. She goes, oh, I'm very happy. I said, and how are you doing with the mourning? Oh, she goes, I've mourned, I've mourned. It's only a week, so like I'm probing here to let her know this is not feeling healthy. And uh, as we're going along, um, I said, I kept asking another question. And she said, Pastor, my husband used to beat me and beat me. She was Hindu. She says, and when he finished beating, he would bring his family over. And they would, because she was Christian, they'd take the Bible and they would beat me. She said, and I went to bed one night and I was broken. I woke up that morning and he didn't. <laughs> It's a sad story, but that's how she told me. And she's, I said to her, okay, well, we're going to have to work through some of how you're feeling. She goes, oh, I'm okay. She goes, I've worked it through. The family normally come and take away the house and everything. They came and gave me my Bible. <laughs> I, I, want, I share that at a different point in the message here just to say, marriage should be joyful. She never lived a day in joy. So in death, which is mournful, she's in great joy. Spouses, don't let your going be the happy time in the marriage. <laughs> are you, are you reading, reading between the lines? Find the joy factors, because marriage to the young people should look like joyful. The, the reason we have so many young people, they don't want to get married. They're shacking up. They're doing everything else because they don't see how this works. It, the marriage, when marriages and homes are ruled by selfishness, domestic tragedies occur. And you heard Pastor Tory, who shared last week about the problem that, that many of the children have, and many of you know it, whether it be broken uh, marriages or marriages that are unhealthy together, it affects the next generation. It affects how many of you have been affected by marriage that are broken or divorced? That is, how many of you in this church? Come on, let me see your hands. All over, affected by, see, it affects generations and it continues. Marriage should be viewed with the privilege, that as a privilege and with permanency. And when it isn't, it causes even the church to be factored into a lower level. Folks, that's not what God is about. Children today, there's consequences they're suffering. Many of them fear marriage. They don't want to grow up and be married. And that's why, as you see the escalation of same sex, many of them are being taught or dragged into this. Why? Because 
They don't see healthiness elsewhere, and this seems to be safe for them. I want you to know when the church isn't modeling good marriage, we're helping society break down the laws of Christ. It is very important that you put yourself aside and say, God, help me to be a better person, because it's not just one sin issue. It's many sin issues that lead to this multiple levels. The Bible never condones divorce. It simply recognizes the reality of divorce, and God expects his church to represent divorce in a better way. One writer says, death is usually clean and, sorry, death is usually clean pain, divorce is usually dirty pain. And many of you have gone through it can tell the pain and the, the, the sling and the, the, the wretchedness or the abandonment or the, the just so many sin issues. You, do you, know, you know how many sin issues happen at that level. That's what God wanted to change. I, I missed one. You could go back for me, Jordan. Divorce should not be viewed by spiritually conscientious Christians as the first and only preferred option. Can I just say that? It should not be the first. The world's nowadays, do you know they're marrying now to divorce? Hello, talk to me, church. Do you know that they're marrying? Hollywood set a trend. You know, oh, like, we're going to do it, but we'll see it for a year, and we're out. Their are marriages now, six months, eight months. I mean, you know, you go pay, you know, $100 for your dress, $75 for your plate, $50 for your gift, and eight months later, you can't ask back for the gift. This is not... There should be a new law. Okay, get, pay me back for my plate, give me back my gift. Or stay, stick it out so, I, so that my investment lasts a year. How many agree we should write it? Let my investment last. But nowadays, young people who do get married are marrying with a short-term view. And then others are like, we're never getting married. We're not getting married. Kids are growing up going, we're not going to. And so you're going to see more and more and more and more that are engaging in, in, in relationships that are not of God. Church, we have got to step it up and we've got to show that marriage is to be joyful even in the midst of pain. You know, what was the song then? I'm going to what? Take, I can't hear. I'm going to sing what? In the middle of the what? Come on. See, he says, up from the ashes. Some of you have gone through the, the, the divorce brought you to ashes, but guess what? Get up from the ashes and let the next generation see the Lord is the strength of my life and still my portion forever. <laughs> Some of you, you've suffered and even to death. You, uh, I, I know someone who said their divorce caused them to have a heart attack and then a stroke, and it was God that took them through. But they got up from the ashes. Hope is alive because Jesus is alive. Marriage is about the kingdom of God. Marriage is about the works of God. Marriage is about the future. Marriage is about the next generation. So even when it's getting painful, sing hallelujah. Sing a little louder and let your peace and your joy continue to show Show the next generation God is still in control. Church, we've gone too far, and we're going to have to pull it back. Let me just race here. See what Jesus was representing, the godly focus. I'm skipping over to six now. Um, marriage is a gift and the work of God that receives its meaning and significance from God. In Mark chapter 10, verse 5, Jesus said, Moses wrote the commandment only as a concession to your hard hearts. Can we recognize today marriages need to be enriched because we all have hardness of heart. And the harder our hearts, the more it breaks everything down. I, 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 I don't know where I lost my time, but I'm going to give you number seven. Parents, honor the leave and cleave biblical clause. I'm just jumping right into that one. The creative truth is that God did not make man and woman plural. He made them a union. He took a rib, made the other. That's a union. He made animals plural. And if you read it, he says, make the animals. He made the cow. They all behave the same. They grow, they drink, they make milk, they eat grass. He made the donkeys. They, they, everything in animal kingdom is in masses. 
okay, with the same behaviors and desires and all of that. But with humans, he made us individual. He took a man, he took a man, took the rib, made a woman, and he says, that's the union I'm creating. Out of one comes another that makes you the same as Christ and God and the Holy Spirit in the sense that they are a union, we are a union. We are to represent in marriage, in the physical, what the union of Christ looks like. Marriage is a gift and the work of God it receives its true significance from God. So today, marriages must be enriched. Marriages must be enriched. And singles, it's, marriage is not about doom and gloom and solitude. And you aspire to, I'm going to stay by myself for the rest of my life until one day you get lonely and then you grab, you know, slew foot. You know, just, 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 just. If you focus on the truth and the happiness of marriage, marriage is not about drudgery, it's about happiness. Marriage is an institution designed for the promotion of happiness. If you keep that in mind, that marriage is an institution designed for the pr promotion of happiness, and that friendships, friendships develop into good marriage, would you begin to develop good friendship because your character comes out, your good side comes out, and, and again... My friends in this church, pray for young marriages, pray for young people, pray for your kids, pray for, begin to pray good spouses for them, good, good spouses. When I want to threaten some of our young boys, I say to them, if they don't do something I want, I said, I'll pray you an ugly wife. And that cures it. They'll always do well for me. You know? <laughs> and, and the girls, I'll pray you a mean husband. See, I just jokingly say that, but friends... We all have something to fix in our own lives. And it comes, Mark throughout it was about, it was about uh, um, healing. It was about miracles. It was about deliverance. It was about faith. All of Mark, all those sins that we've been going through, Mark saying fix it. Because it comes to a day like this where we're watching the world tell us that we can't speak marriage from our pulpit. In the name of Jesus, and I'm going to declare this to the camera for those who are watching it. Marriage is in the word of God. It says, parents, let the son leave and the daughter leave and let them cleave together and become one. Leave and cleave is a good thing, parents. Even when they come home for food, send them on to leave and cleave after that. But it's a strong passage where God was saying, the union that you do in the physical represents what I want you to understand in the spiritual. Yes, it's broken down. The world has broken it down. But we, God's children, are going to do our best to raise it up and let the sanctity of marriage be lifted up again. Can I hear an amen this morning? Young people, it means for you, if you're like, oh, I was just going to date and get to know different people and never marry one of them, cut it out. Ask God to provide you someone Who's going to be a life partner that's going to go from grow from friendship to intimacy it's going to be your better your better half your better build on both sides help you to find out what makes you good and you help them to find out what makes them good and you promote each other and you encourage each other and you learn to say sorry man we teach it in marriage all the time. Say sorry, sorry, sorry. Just get the sorry out early. When you don't get out the first sorry early, you have to do five sorries later to make up for it. And women, stop expecting them to be God. I can't understand why I didn't marry God. Well, he didn't marry you. You know, he, he saved you, healed you, delivered you. No man is perfect. Ladies, no man is perfect. You, you, you knew his imperfection when you married him, but you wanted the marriage, so you took it. So fix it. Ladies, we have some issues that are killing the next generation. Men, fathers, got some issues that are killing the next generation. Can you start by working on your marriage? And there are broken marriages in here that it's irreparable. Remember what Moses said? I did it so that you wouldn't kill each other. God understands it. God understands that. But fix you so that you will be a better you no matter what. Are you all with me this morning? Glory to God. I'm going to do, I need about, I need about five minutes of your time extra. I'm going to do something that I feel is very strong. I want everyone who's here today without your spouse 
If you're without your spouse, I want you to stand. You're, 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 you're married, but you're without your spouse. Not widowed or divorced or anything. You're without your spouse. Okay, so I want all of you without your spouse, I want you to come over in this corner. And um, you're just going to come right over in this corner right here. And Pastor Rob is over there with you. I want you to put those verses on the board. Oh, there's... Could you put those verses on the board for me? Here. While you're coming, you're going to choose something to say to each other. So you're going to have to look up on this board. So step out a little. I want you to look up here. Choose something to say. You're, you're, you're going to... You're going to... Their spouse isn't here. So you're just going to remind them. Okay? Just a reminder. Okay? Don't, don't, don't say it lovingly because that's not your spouse. <laughs> don't go... You are precious in God's sight. See, there's two ways ladies are doing things. You can go, you are precious. Or you can go, you are precious in God's sight, speaking life into that person. Over here, just step right into this section. You're going to speak life into each other, men. Find some men and speak it. And then just ask them their spouse's name. And just, 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 we're just going to have encouraged prayer over here. Singles, you're going to stay out there because there's widowed, divorced, single by choice, single by lack of choice, and I'm abandoned. I want you, you're going to gather in twos or threes, and you're going to speak this into each other because nobody's saying it to you. So you're going to say it to each other. So here, the, here, here they are. Say it with me. Okay? You are, come on, where are you? Come on. You are great in God's sight. You are precious in God's sight. You are beautiful in creation. You are the apple of God's eye. You have been chosen by God for his good purposes. You are a treasure to God. So this is what you're going to do out there, singles. You're going to have two or three of you. And you're going to just start from the top. And you're going to say, you're a treasure to God. You, you are precious in God's sight. You're God's beautiful creation. You are the apple of God's eye. I want, what, is there one more? You have been chosen by God for his good purposes. I want you to speak, church, into each other's spirit. And don't be shy. So if, you're the, if you came to church, it's your first time, if you're first visiting, and you're a little shy, I'm not shy. So just kind of take from me today. Just don't be afraid of anybody. Because you know what we need to do? Start speaking these things into each other so that the world doesn't destroy us. That's what all the singles that are left in the pews are going to do. So you say, left in the pews? I want every couple up here, please. Every couple. Just everyone standing right now. Every couple. Jesus. Just give me a lick. Every couple, just face me, every couple. All over, just grab your spouse. Jesus. Just spread right out, all the couples. Come on up here. Just press right in. I need some more room over here. Jesus, Jesus. Singles out there. Normally, you say, oh, but they forgot about me. No, because I'm single too. So you're, you got the best of everything because you got a single pastor. I know how this feels. Mm, so I take care of my people first. <laughs> Praise God. Your marriage is not just about you. It's about society. It's about your church. It's about the next generation. It's about the future of God's kingdom. Your marriage is not just how you feel. It's what you do for our national interest. When marriages are broken down, everything breaks national, and we're there already. We're there today where everything else is permissible, but God's word should be suppressed because they don't understand the union, the beauty, and the power of marriage. So today at this altar, you're going to pray with each other. You're going to speak to each other. You may have some issues and somebody's wrong. Okay? Granted, let me tell you right now, one of you is wrong. But I don't care which one is wrong. Because you're both going to apologize one to the other. What are you apologizing for? You know. 
Jesus know, he know, or she know. I don't need to know. But when you do those up sincere apologies to each other right at this altar, you know what? Do it from your heart so they know exactly which one of the things you're apologizing for. If you got five or six, do five or six little, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Okay? But I shouldn't have to say I'm sorry, Pastor. You know what? Let's leave the sin issue out of it. Just do the, just do the forgiveness at the altar today. That's what we're going to do. And then you're going to speak life. You're going to speak one of those things into your spouse. Women, you're going to speak something. Men, you're going to speak something. When you came together, you signed before God that you're going to last. Life comes, pain comes, trouble comes, disappointment comes, hurt comes. Some of you have done some things that have crushed your spouse's spirit. That doesn't remain. Because this is an altar where we need to press for healing. In the name of Jesus, we need to press for healing. Amen. Those of you that are out there that are living together, I, our pastors, not me always, but our pastors are available for marriage ceremonies. We'll give you a discount from today. They're going to sing in a moment. I want you to look to face each other now. And I want you to start talking to each other. Forget what, just say the I'm sorry to their eyes. Just say it. Over here, I want you to just, just pray for each other. Find a couple of people here. You're all in the same boat. Your spouse are not here. Find, come man, turn around and find another gentleman behind you. Turn around and find another gentleman behind you. Ladies, go with each other. Okay? There's another gentleman there. Ladies, find some ladies. Encourage each other. Ask their name. Ask the spouse's name. Ask the, ask the spouse's name. Just push through. Would you let some people push through if they need to? Don't, don't block them. Don't block them. Ladies, right there. Break it up and put these men together so they can talk. And you three go together. Fix it. Fix it. There's a gentleman over there. Go there. Ladies, go right here. Right here. You, sir, go right over there where those men are. Amen. There's, speak something into each other's life. Just encourage each other. Ask them their name. Ask them their name. Ask them their name. Glory to God. Singles, I want you to just move about a little bit. Just go say something to somebody. Somebody needs it today. Would you stand up out there? Somebody needs it. Somebody needs you to speak something to them. All of you just stand out there for me. Somebody needs you to... Uh, is Anthony here to stand by? Just go say something. Just say something to somebody. We stop honoring each other and we need to. We need to. We need to. We need to. Jesus, just softly now, softly. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus.